get started. Uh, and if, I mean, people can come and go as, as they, uh, they need to. Uh, but So my name's Pat Miller, and so I'm part of the organizing group uh, today, and I'll be moderating the panel, so I'll do my best to kind of uh, stay out of it a little bit and let uh, you folks uh, talk. We've, we've got some people here who have uh, a variety of backgrounds, which is awesome, so we're, we're uh, you know, learn from some unique experiences. So. Uh, we'll kind of start with Sultan. We'll go just down the row here. People can just say kind of, you know, who you are and, and, uh, and maybe a little bit about yourself. And while we're at it, we're not going to stop at Nicholas. We're going to go all the way around just so we all know who we are. And then we'll get into the questions. Uh, we have four. If we get through all of them, that's that's great. If we get beyond that, I'm sure there's lots of other things that we could uh, use to fill the time. So cool. Start. All right. Yeah. So I'm Sultan Rana, and I am the digital literacy resource teacher for. York Region District School Board. I represent the North, which is 43 schools from Newmarket all the way up to Georgina Island. And um, in supporting them in, in integration of uh, modern practices in pedagogy, assessment, and student engagement. Um, in my own personal interests, I do uh, as much as I can um, to talk the talk and walk the walk of uh, equity and inclusivity um, for various identities um, that. I, I tried, I've tried to fit that into my portfolio, and thankfully at the organization I work at, it's not been hard to do that. So a uh, few experiences here and there, and yeah, and I'll probably hopefully elaborate on that later on. Great. Andrew? So as I alluded to this morning, uh, I am, my name's Andrew McConnell. I am the First Nation Métis Inuit Education Coordinator. I was one of the um, advisors, um, and I get to work with a really good team of advisors, other people are in Mission Army like myself. Uh, Pam Agawa used to be in this role, she's moved on to Keswick, and she's a, a good friend that I work with, it's one of her own um, and, and Sultan, and all the people down in curriculum that I get to work with. Um, it's an interesting time to work in the York Region District School Board because there's so much change happening, and, and I think it's being done in a much better way than it is in the past. There is a lot of this discussion going on where everybody's being allowed to be who they are as opposed to a very top-down model. Is allowing for change to happen in a good way. You, know, you find people are much more engaged when you go go change that way. So, and I'm here today to kind of, uh, I guess, to talk about all things Nishinaabe and connections to the rest of the world. Um, so, so Jennifer asked me to possibly join the panel today because I'm um, there's no women on the panel, so I so um, uh, that's a voice that she thought would be beneficial. But also, I have a, another unique lens in that I'm. Uh, I've been, I've been teaching, I graduated from U of T as of, of 23 years ago, and I've been almost my entire career in, in working with First Nations communities. Um, and currently, my, I'm um, at Manitoulin Secondary School. And if you've been paying attention to you know, the news, we've had some really um, challenging times lately, um, bringing to the forefront um, racial issues and tensions that have existed. It's a, our population is 50%. Indigenous communities, um, seven First Nations, and a tuition agreement with the Rainbow District School Board. But we are a provincial school, but we have uh, about 50% Anishinaabe students. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, not not of Anishinaabe descent, but have watched this unfold and it's still going on. So, um, and definitely the world of digital citizenship has impacted on that and changed the dialogue tremendously. <laughs> uh, Bill Corcoran, um, I'm a learning technologies coordinator now with the Ottawa Catholic School Board and I've had a journey over the last seven years with our program that we initiated and I've worked with uh, Jessica on the OSAPAC uh, resources that were released and sort of released over the last five years and so I've just been invested in this journey with all of you um, over that time so I'm excited to be here. Uh, hi again, uh, my name is Nick, uh, so by day I am a database and CRM manager by nights and weekends I am the operations director and summit director Institute, and I'm also Mary Alice today, so I'm wearing many hats. Wow. Um, yeah. So I'm working on being an extrovert as much as I possibly can. Um, my focus in graduate school when I was with Mary Alice was really centered around LGBTQ identity and how, um, really, how the focus on homophobic bullying impacts college matriculation rates. And that was the lens I looked through when I was there because I was in higher ed at the time as a recruiter, and it was important to me because I got to college, but that doesn't mean that all students who identify on the spectrum do. Um, I am part of the more privileged part of that spectrum. I'm a white, male, cisgendered, 
that I identify as candy along that spectrum. Um, I just miss here with me today. But it, it has an impact on you when you are moving through high school. And I got to examine that when I was in graduate school with Mary Alice, and that's kind of how I came to be here today. Um, and also because Jennifer asked me last night at like 9 o'clock to be on this panel. That's also mm -hmm. how I um, so I'm excited to be here and kind of share my perspective. Kieran Pine. Uh, I am a learning coach, K-12 learning coach for Toronto District School Board. I am also a digital lead learner. Um, I've spent a lot of time um, thinking about how digital technologies can level the academic playing field, but I'm really hoping to extend um, how my work uh, with teaching through technology to uh, be more equitable for students who are marginalized. I'm Michael Kikile. I'm um, a director general, which is uh, like a director of education in, in, uh, in, in Ontario from Montreal. Um, so I'm the director general of um, Lester B. Pearson School Board. Uh, we have about 25,000 students. Uh, we started on the digital citizenship journey uh, working with my Ribble uh, about uh, six, seven years ago. Uh, so we opened up uh, the internet, and uh, I was never a big believer that we need to tie down things and, and, and keep. Uh, students away from what's out there, so we opened everything up, but before we, we did that, we put a digital citizenship uh, philosophy uh, curriculum in place, and uh, eight years later, we're, we're quite proud of a lot of the initiatives we've done, and, and we're also at the cusp now of, of, uh, of, of removing the word digital, and it's just about citizenship. Right. Yes. Um, I'm Jess Sonthorn, I'm a full-time teacher librarian in Central County. I've been passionate about digital citizenship for some time now, as well as just trying to find ways to foster empathy in students. I do a lot of that um, in the library through various activities and read alouds and makerspace activities. Um, and I, again, I worked with Bill on the OSAPAC Digital Citizenship Project a few summers ago, and it was a great experience to make those connections with, with the group. And, learn ways that I can bring digital citizenship in and integrate it into my library program. Good morning, my name is Claire Gerda, the Vice Principal of the District School Board. I'm here to learn today. Hi, my name is Chelsea Apple. I'm a hybrid teacher and a digital lead learner with Toronto District School Board. In the morning, I teach kindergarten, and in the afternoon, I support uh, teachers uh, with deep learning through technology as well as global competencies, uh, but I'm very, very passionate about media literacy, and that's my entry point into global competencies. Um, I just came here to learn today, and I'm really happy to be here. Hi, I'm Michelle Solomon. I'm also with the TASB on the secondary panel. Uh, first year as a full-time teacher librarian at Northern Secondary School. And uh, for this panel, I'm here to learn, but uh, I'm also part of the Association for Media Literacy. Perfect. All right. So, um, I'll just be jumping back and forth here, but the title of the panel was uh, Building Community and Inclusivity, Honoring Marginalized Voices. And one of the things that when Jennifer and I were talking about the panel was, we felt like there are people out there who want to start, want to make that, that connection with these marginalized voices, but they don't know how to start. They don't know how to do it respectfully. They don't know how to do it in a meaningful way and in a sustainable way. So it's not a one in and out and then connections broken they're looking for sustainability so that's kind of the premise so we've got four questions and maybe we'll start with uh, we'll go the other way this time we start with uh, Nick uh, what cultural norms do we need to be aware of when trying to establish connections to these communities so give you guys a chance to think about that or Nick do you, do you have something you want to start with or do you want to that's a tough one I know Ooh, I thought we start easy um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll dive into the then. Um, yeah. So, and this is something that I learned through a roommate I had when I lived in DC for a while, and um, a lot of the times it is celebrated, uh, the aspect of coming out is always celebrated in the LGBT community. And it's something that is specific to the individual. Um, coming out to me is different than coming out to someone else, and is different than just coming out to someone else. Um, and by that I mean, for me, as someone who was raised Irish Catholic in New England with fairly conservative parents, um, that's a different experience than someone who might be growing up on the West Coast in an extremely liberal bubble whose parents are okay in that sense. And then that crosses another divide into cultural and ethnicity as well. Um, so my roommate at the time grew up Nicaraguan, grew up 
South Side LA, and that was not something that was pushed. It was not something that was celebrated as something you had to do. Coming out was something that was individual to the person you were speaking to. So I would come out to you based off of our relationship, or I wouldn't come out to you based off our relationship. And that's not how I ever looked at it from my perspective, because once I was out, I was out. And I thought everybody should be out. And it's not true for everyone that they should be out to everyone, because then jeopardizes relationships, safety, security, things along those lines. So the concept of coming out, while generally celebrated, is unique to the individual. Um, so coming out day, and everyone's thought it. We all have that person in our lives where we're like, waiting for it. Um, let them handle the closet door the way they want to handle the closet door, because it's really unique to their specific situation. Great, thank you. Um, so thinking about um, the, uh, I'm going to speak to this from like a rural community um, context because of um, a very rural area, um, uh, lots of lots of people whose entire experience with the world is just through social media. And so um, in that, and um, we live in an area on um, Manitoulin where there's not much for kids to do. Um, it used to be, you know, drink and hunt and fish, but, um, you know, not a lot of entertainment. And with the, the onset of digital media, um, when we finally had, you know, the entire island covered by cell towers, which we only happened two years ago, like there was, there's a whole, world of young people and parents um, who are who are engaging in the world um, from as an as a form of entertainment um, as a way of, rec of recreation and spending a lot of time figuring out the the self that they're going to project out into the world so in thinking about norms in, in establishing connections um, you have to trust who you're connecting with that they're being forth, right? And that they're telling you what they want the world, have the self they want the world to see. But you also have to be a critical thinker about what, where they're coming from and that they are just speaking for themselves. Um, as Andrew said, like one Anishinaabe person in one of our First Nations who has their own vantage point does not speak for even their community, like their own com their community, their school, their um, their their demographic. They don't speak for everybody, and so really taking a personal approach in building those relationships, trusting that person that they are being as honest and telling the truth that they see, but that's not the whole truth ever, and so that to be. On, um, to be questioning and thinking and seeking other voices to provide a, a bigger picture in terms of, and, and specifically um, in Manitoba Secondary School, that flew into a, a, a media circus really um, after a couple of voices told their truths and were repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated and completely fell away from what actually happened in our building on that um, day and the you know the uh, that the, the, the truth became secondary to those people and speaking to students who were engaged in that dialogue uh, you know it was fun that was what it was it was fun it was powerful it was empowering to them which is great but it was just it was entertainment and what, and the ramifications in terms of our students, their teenagers, even some of the adults, they're so inexperienced with the, with the world in that, in the social media sense, that they didn't think of the ramifications and they didn't think of the repercussions, both in terms of perceptions and also in terms of personal relationships right at home. So, so those are my thoughts on the norms. So, I mean, really, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna build off exactly what Yana said, because it's so important. Um, culture is a really complex thing, because as much as a culture is shared by a group of people, it shows up in different ways based on the individual. You've already heard that twice, right? I mean, Nicholas said that. Um, you know, coming out is a cultural thing, 
but it's expressed in different ways within the individual, and you have to really understand that when you're coming into contact. I mean, I guess in this case, I'll take on the Anishinaabek lens at this point. Um, I'm Southern Anishinaabe, right? And I don't live next to my community. I never have lived next to my community. I know where my community is. I have experiences of visiting my community. I have family who live on my community, but I am, as much as I am Nipissing First Nation, I am not directly of that community. It hasn't been my lived experience. Uh, my experience is urban Anishinaabe, which is growing up apart from where you come from. And, and you run into this issue with that if, you know, if you've have a rural experience where you get to live with all these other Anishinaabe people in your community, and you get to know them, and you have these conversations, and then you try to bring those conversations down here, and you come and you meet me, and you say, oh, Anishinaabe, oh, you do this, you do this, you do this, and I might be going, yeah, no, I don't. I grew up in around Toronto. Hunting is not a tradition in Toronto. People tend to frown on you walking around with long guns in the city. Um, you know, whereas in a rural community, it isn't just Anishinaabe people who go hunting. It's the community, both sets that go hunting. Um, so you have to understand that really when you're starting, the cultural norm, norm is really the human norm. You start by introducing yourself, letting people know who you are, not what you do. And, I, and, and it's interesting because I've become very aware in my career that you know I do a traditional greeting, and Sultan's heard me do it a million times. Um, I'll start in the Shnabe Moen every single time now, but then you, know, you get this really long explanation of who I am in Anishinaabe. And so anybody who's Anishinaabe gets a pretty good understanding of who I am, where I'm coming from. And then we get to English, and I'm flipping to English. Hi, my name's Andrew McConnell, and I'm, uh, I'm a teacher. That really doesn't work when you're trying to make connections with a culture you're new to. Because when I say I'm a teacher in Ontario, people automatically get an understanding and a representation of who I am and what I do and what I know. And I can even make it more specific. I can say, hi, I'm a high school teacher. And okay, that adds a little more detail in. And then I can say, yeah, I'm a high school technology teacher. And then people build other images in their mind of who I am and what I am. But when you flip into who I am as an Anishinaabe person, it's a brand new culture for many people. You have to come to it slowly and get to know who I am. And then really and truly understand that I am only one version of what that looks like. And that really is where we have to start, is we go slow, get to know the individual. Yeah, the damage of a single narrative, single story about one particular group is um, very, has huge ramifications. I wanted to look at this from a cultural norm of, in the context of social media. So I'll set the context for you that I'm assuming that one would want to actually engage with a, you know, a marginalized group. Um, it's in pursuit of being an ally, right? So it's the idea that you are, you you have good intentions or it's it's not a fact-finding mission. There is some um, imperative or reason that you're reaching out. Um, I would say in the, with as, as we heard, the diversity of, of the ways in which people live, um, it's the intersectionality of a great deal of things. It's not just their race or, or sexuality or where they come from, it's the intersectionality of all of those. What I would say is in the, the context of even this, this uh, conference is that you're reaching out to them in a, through a digital medium. And with that is the nuances in the culture of engaging in social media. A couple of things. First of all, if you're in pursuit of allyship, you reach out to people. And the one thing I would think is could be blanketed across all cultures is the understanding of consent. You be clear with why are you interacting you be clear as to what are you looking to gain from this interaction or relationship. Um, and if it's flippant or casual or just like, you know, I read a tweet you wrote and I'm inspired, be very clear with that. And anything you do or say or retweet or tweet, do it with the idea of consent. And whatever social media platform you're using, you figure out what that looks like. If it's a direct message, great. If it is a, um, you know, uh, reaching out to an email, great. But um, the one thing I would say that, and I'll speak for myself here, uh, the one thing that um, irks me is that at the moment, allyship and supporting marginalized groups is sexy right now. It's fashionable. Uh, it's as simple as retweeting and being like, boom, I'm an ally. Um, and really what it's done is people who have popularity in the educational tech world and the they call them edu-famous uh, intellectual circles. People who have power and leverage 
will do that, just a simple retweet, and that is the extent of their allyship. So I guess the biggest thing I would say put forth is um, consent could be blanketed across all, culture, all cultural norms. I think that's just probably the most appropriate way of engagement, but at the end of it, what's imperative is you gotta ask yourself, have you made this attempt to connect about yourself? Is it for popularity? Is it for leverage? Is it for the fact that, yes, it seems like the people that I admire is being, are being an ally for FNMI or racialized youth, I should do it too. And if that's the extent of how far you go, then that's problematic. So uh, in summary, like in summary, what everyone said here, it's, it's cultural norms are very unique. There's culture with a small C and culture with a big C. Culture with a small C is, yeah, I'm Muslim, I'm Canadian, I'm whatever. But culture with a big C is intersectionality of many things and it's super complicated, we couldn't cover it here. But consent and clarity, I'd say are two big things. Does anyone have any comments or questions about what we've heard so far? For me, the, the one thing that is resonating is what Nicholas started and everyone has kind of talked about is this idea of we often paint groups in large areas with, with a single wide brush, right? And we just go across. I, I spent uh, some time in uh, Thunder Bay late last year, and one of the one of the things that the people I spoke to was they think the north is all the same, right? So if you're in the north, it's this one brush they paint the entire north with, and I think that is something that's a danger. Um, and what uh, Sultan was just talking about also uh, struck me is, so someone who's edgy famous who retweets something of a marginalized group, the people who follow that person are probably thinking, oh, they're, they're more deeply involved in that than they really are. So it's almost a misrepresentation if that's all you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Um, does anyone else have any, any other kind of follow-up questions or anything they want to ask about uh, this question to anyone on the panel or anyone else? It was a big conversation yesterday because we had the e-learning um, bolt conference yesterday right. in town. And uh, when you're dealing completely with e-learning and having uh, individual students from across the province as part of your um, class, um, making those assumptions and knowing what their needs are and ultimately getting to know that student is a big challenge of, of practice as well. So that's where it was, it was nice that that conversation was being led there because I may mean, have somebody in, in any part of Ontario as part of this uh, course. And, is a blind brush to assume not even just the north, right? Not even like uh, just to say that I'm a teacher in Toronto or in Ottawa and I understand Ontario or a different community, but even within our own city or within our own school um, is a huge deal. So it's, it was a great sort of jumping point for today of a frame of mind. Great. Okay, so this the next question actually uh, goes nicely because it moves from this idea of um, what we talked a little bit about intentions of why we're reaching out and as Sultan said, being clear with that. Uh, the next one has to do with um, what, what, what do you need to be mindful of in terms of what actual harm could come from that, that interaction? Um, and without kind of uh, leading any of the discussion, I just, uh, when I think about the harm, uh, it reminds me of times where you uh, engage with a group uh, and it's a one-time engagement and then you you build up uh, the thought that there might be a, an extended or a sustainable connection, but then it disappears. And, and we see that over and over again, uh, where groups will reach out to a, a class or a group in another part of the world or even in Ontario, and then they just, it just kind of disappears. We've done that checkbox thing that we, we made that connection, but it's not a sustainable thing. So um, what harms do we need to be mindful of when we're engaging in these relationships? Um, does anyone else want to start first this time? Sure. Um, so the two things that come to mind uh, initially for me around harms are um, around tokenism, right? Like is, um, is that idea that, oh, well, we, uh, we're, um, we're, do, we're acting on one of the calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, so we're going to reach out and uh, do a Twitter chat with a school and a tool, and, and that's our, that's our call, you know, way of building reconciliation, but not in a not in a reciprocated way, really just taking and, and feel with it, you know, disingenuously learning, right? And that's one thing. And then, um, and then not, and then the other harm is, that comes to me is the idea of not, not doing the work in preparation, right? Just coming at um, the learning that can happen, the potential, the possibilities 
but really restricting those because of lack of forethought, lack of even questioning your motives, questioning the um, the 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 intents, questioning the outcomes before you even engage in that dialogue and having you know someone say, oh, you're you're um, you teach in the First Nations community, um, can we? do a letter writing exchange like, outside social media. Like, um, why, <laughs> on what, for what purpose? And just like really, um, and that's a, that's a responsibility to model for teachers, for, to their students. Like, let's learn, let's find out, let's, let's figure out um, what it is. And maybe there's the connection that is not a more connection of that ever, that ever happens because you realize it isn't going to be a genuine exchange of ideas. And it's going to harm those because it's going to build on stereotypes, assumptions, all those things that the, 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 both communities will suffer from. And the harm is both ways. The harm is on the kids who are really wanting to learn, and the kids who uh, have want to have a voice and feel like they're that what they have to say matters, and that neither one of them gets bad, and they end up being disempowered in the end. So yeah, I mean, the harm really is in the individual, and that's why I think people really need to be understanding. I mean, when you're kind of interactive online, you, know, you see a, a faceless being in most cases, or you know, there's a face there, you're not even sure it's theirs. Um, what you don't realize is that in those interactions, you cause a lot of pain and suffering on the other side. I know that um, whenever something sort of sparks up within the indigenous communities, something legal or somebody has gone missing or something bad has happened and we will connect online and commiserate and share and then somebody else who really does not belong with those communities will pipe up and throw in their two cents which is generally not even worth the two cents they're just saying it for the sake of saying it they have no understanding of how much actual physical and mental anguish they create I'm not talking even about the trolls who go out to cause that harm talking about people who just, they take their perspective and their understanding and their world and somehow try to interject it in there. Well, if the person had just done this, or if the person had just behaved this way, uh, they wouldn't have had that problem. And you hear that all the time without really understanding at all that you're talking about and into a world that you do not live in, that you do not understand. And, and because you do not approach it with humility, you leave people feeling really horrible after the fact. So it's like, victimized. yeah, victimized. And it really is a victimization, uh, which then leads to more tweets afterwards as we all kind of spread, you know, the other tweet that we hated around and really trash the other person. And somebody who thought they were just throwing in the two cents can also then get victimized back where, you know, the huge pile on. And it's this lack of humility that can lead to so much pain and suffering in real people. And I think that's something that is often missed. Um, in, in very much in line I wrote the progression of what started here um, it's also the concern of you will also the, the way in which you engage or what you think is work or help is actually just perpetuating the continual perception or stereotype or how the, the, the status of those people are uh, seen in society um, or even just a narrative around them. Um, if you're looking for a context to fit this in, uh, one could easily see it right now in the conversations being had around to remove To Kill a Mockingbird from the, uh, from the English programs. Um, on the grounds that it's, it's perpetually still reinstating a paradigm of a group of people that uh, you know you're you're constantly oppressed. You've been oppressed. You will keep being oppressed, and there will always be well-meaning, uh, well-mannered white people to come and save you and help you. Um, and that's been essentially what's been perpetuated in things like To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, people say that you know it, it's great. It brings it brings ideas of injustice and everything, but it's still it's it's sometimes the entry point or the first time students get to learn about the systemic um, disenfranchisement of, of black North Americans, 
But then the thing is, they see it, and because it's a book from the 50s, they think that's the past, and they think, oh, things have been better, and really, it's not. It's just morphed into new, uh, nuanced ways of being uh, more acceptable because, you know, things like the end bomb aren't being dropped um, by legal officials, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's this issue of, of you think you're doing, your intentions were good, your, your intentions of engagement were good, but um, it's just still perpetuating the same paradigm, the same perception people have of a particular group, marginalized group, um, and it's doing just as much harm as, as it did before. And arguments can also be held against with um, conversations around slavery. Um, there are, I, I can't speak on behalf of, of the full movement, but there are fears of what this is, the conversation around residential schools, that we just keep living in this idea that it's been in the past, it's occurred in the past, um, look how far we've come so far, and we're talking about it. That is maybe the first step, but there are a flight of stairs going all the way to CN Tower after that that need to be taken uh, for true reconciliation for all marginalized groups. So um, that's, in my opinion, some of the damage that could be had. Just maintaining the same status quo and paradigm. Um, and for me, it's letting, it's letting social media and the media, which same thing at this point in day and time, um, paint the narrative for you or create the story for you, and then building the assumption around that. I am not a pretty drag queen. Like, uh, the social media, media has you believing that many of us in the community are RuPaul, and that is not the case for us, and that's one tiny little glimmering example. Um, have I strapped on a pair of heels in my life? Yes, I have, but that is okay. I mean, it's different for everyone. Don't let what you see in social media, what you see online, paint the story for every gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or queer person, because firstly, we've been lumped into one acronym, and we are five extremely different groups, and I do not speak for any of them. I speak for me and my personal experience. And what happens is we meet one person, or we see one celebrity. We see Tyler Oakley, who is an amazing YouTube personality, but we paint that, or we let it paint the picture for what every gay individual looks like or we see someone who is a high-profile lesbian or someone who is trans, and we let that paint the picture, paint the narrative for every person who then fits that label. Don't let it do that, go deeper. Go deeper than the social media. Um, it's the best way to seek understanding is create the gap or uh, bridge the gap with social media, make that initial connection, but don't let that be the stopping point. Go beyond that. Let human connections still exist beyond Facebook and Twitter and what you see on Instagram. Or where it continually lives. Yeah, right. Just living in that. Yeah, so it's beyond. And, and, and it's shallow. And I'm thinking, like, get. I, I love the word humility. I think that's true. And listening, rather than feeling like you have to contribute, is is okay. Um, you know, it used to be a bad thing. Just to what was the phrase for it when you worked in the just watching and reading and not actually contributing to the social media. But that's not a bad thing. Because you're listening and you're learning, but also asking questions. Yes. More that yes. than anything else. Uh, not out loud, but writing down, doing that thinking of what do I need to know? Where, what's my next step? What do I want to learn? Where, um, where can I learn it? Where are all the different places I can learn it? And who can I talk to that I have a relationship with already? That I can, that I can, that there's trust built, and that they that is I can, that they'll welcome my learning. And it might be someone in your board. It might be someone in you know, is someone you have who's in your family, who knows, right? But the asking questions, thinking about those rather than answers, right? Yeah. And when you mess up, apologize and get on with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does anyone have anything, a comment or a further question? Yeah. yeah. Humble and um, 
to approach things with humility, not not to disengage or leave it alone, um, but but to approach it with humility. So humility is a core key idea. I mentioned each one of it this morning. Uh, seven grandfathers. Humility is one of those key things, um, and it is interesting because I talk a lot right now um, among teachers about how do you approach and engage with indigenous content in the classroom, you know, what can you touch on and what should you avoid, those sorts of things. Um, and it really does come down to we do what we've been shown how to do. And this is why humility is so difficult within our school systems, within our educational systems, because they're not built on humility. Not at all. They're actually built on the exact opposite. They're built on sage on the stage, and the sage on the stage is automatically occupying a position at the front of the room, standing up while everybody sits, of power, privilege, and um, pride. Pride to the point where we place extra letters after our names, pride to the point where we'll just say, you know, I am the teacher, and what, you know what I mean? Like, those are the systems we grew up in, those are the systems we were educated in, and when you've made it to that position, you know, you've also been taught that this pride is not necessarily a bad thing, even though it is a seven deadly sin. Um, that humility really comes from how do you approach your teaching. So, and this is difficult because that's not how we were taught. I mean, it, it is to a certain degree how I was taught in certain parts of my life. Um, but when it comes to education, and as an educator in front of the room, and, and it's funny, I, I, I've been very introspective the last few years. My default when I am uncomfortable about something. I do not feel I know it very well. My default has always been to go to stage on the stage and I'm up front and I'm talking loud and I default to that model of pridefulness in my behavior. Not my humility that comes from when I teach something I actually know really well. And the thing is, those things that I teach really well, you know, you might assume I teach them really well because I know them so well, but I think it's because of the way I teach them. I'm very humble a lot of humility in my approach and I've since taken on that role. Humility is something we show the kids so and this is what I've spent a lot of the last year and a half trying to do with teachers to get them to admit to their kids I do not know much when they're trying to engage with indigenous content to be honest about their own experience and their own truth which is this was not taught when I was in school and so what I am teaching you what I'm asking you to come to know is not something that I actually know and that I'm engaging with the curriculum in a new way exactly the same time as they are. And when you show that, you know, in English we call it vulnerability, which is ridiculous because it's not being vulnerable, it's being courageous. It's being truly brave to admit what you do and do not know. And that's where you start to see that paradigm shift and you start to see the world sort of the way we do. Humility is not about being less. It's about being exactly who you are and then being comfortable with everybody else being exactly who they are. It's not about placing yourself below other people, it's about placing yourself on an equal level playing field with all those people in your room. And when you start to instruct kids that, well then they start to share that. I mean, we all know those things when you're sitting in the classroom, you say, hey, what do you think about? They all go, and they don't give you an answer because they don't know the answer that you want from them. And even though you didn't have an answer you were looking for, they think you do because all of their education up to this point from K to whenever you get them, has taught them there is a right answer. Not a truth, there is a right answer. And yet when you start to award them and reward them and talk about their own personal truths, they start to see they actually do have something to offer in a conversation, which is amazing. So how do you get them to be humble in their approach? You have to start there. Remember, everybody learns from other people based on what they're shown. You can say be humble, but if you're not actually humble within that classroom, there is no way those students are going to do it. And the only point when they will really start to truly share is when they've reached a position where you step into a place where they know a lot. But they're students, they're in a classroom, they're there to learn. They're not there because they know a lot about a subject. Does that make sense? Can I answer that? Yeah. I have a thought too, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. um, humility is in uh, in my opinion, at least experience in the classroom, humility is, is a state in which you enter into that you, that an educator can only scaffold the student to get to, get to that point. 
Um, I feel, and, and even what I'm saying right now, uh, this could apply from kindergarten all the way to grade 12. Um, students have, as Andrew was saying, we've been socialized into understanding um, either nuances, norms, or uh, life lessons in a particular way. And just to give an example, many of us have been socialized into believing that we don't see particular things. You know, everyone is the same. We're all the human race. Everyone, you know, should be accepted as they are, and that is the way in which society has kind of, um, that's, that's been turning the wheels. That's what we've been led to believe. So if on those grounds you believe that everyone's equal, everyone's on an equal playing field, thus, that means, sorry, that means that those who are living in squalor, those who are living uh, disenfranchised, those who are poverty-stricken, that is the summation of their efforts that they put in. They earned that state. So, if that's what, you, what you've understood all your life, it's very easy to compartmentalize people around the world. And it's very easy to compartmentalize groups of people. When you scaffold students into understanding that the way they've been socialized, the way they've been brought into the world, thinking a certain thing is untrue. That shakes the foundation in which they believe everything uh, is built on. Only then, when they, are so, when they are brought to the point of realizing, oh my God, I need to unlearn a great deal that I have had a part in constructing, and I'm talking even in the context of grade one and two. When you bring them to that point, humility is the state in which they arrive themselves. They put themselves there. Because the things that they had a part in constructing in their own minds and believing, and once scaffolded through a very rich educational experience, realize it's untrue, they will be in the state of humility. And thus, they can move forward in a state that they, they that you had a you had a hand in bringing them into, but they arrived there by themselves. So, I guess to answer your question is intention intentionality uh, in learning experiences that allow for critical thinking, self interrogation, um, and and pondering as to do you really believe the world is the way it is? And yes, it's super difficult and uncomfortable because regardless of what uh, race, gender, and identities that you carry forward, and the privileges you carry forward, you have to have those difficult conversations about, you know what, race actually does matter. Sexuality does matter. Um, and when you're both those together, it's a whole new meaning as well. So it's, it's, it's a very um, hard conversation to have and age appropriate is, um, shouldn't be a hindrance in my opinion. There are ways to enter into these conversations with everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. It's almost like reading my mind. So I immediately, in it, um, when you asked the question, and then as, as Andrew was talking, I was thinking like the piece is about me metacognitive, right? Is how it was said this morning. How do you know what you know? Well, how is it? That, and starting to and and I teach secondary. Um, but I think I think it's right that you can do this with very young kids, and they're almost more open because they're they have less to unlearn. Um, is to start like asking them to to confront their and interrogate themselves as a great not just reflect but interrogate themselves, really dig at their own thinking and why do you think what you think and question and accept that everyone has a bias. That's a that everyone has a bias. That it is not something that you can oh, I, I'm a non-biased person, that's not a real thing, and getting kids to recognize that in our um, in our education system, that every single person walks into every situation with their own biases, and that's okay, as long as they acknowledge those biases, as long as they're aware of their biases, and they don't let those biases um, completely color their experience of the world, and their interactions, and their relationships, and their own self, sense of self. Their biases are deep-rooted, and they color their own self-perception and their own um, experience of their lives and um, so that's it's a really powerful thing to, to, to go to with kids and it's very uncomfortable and it may, is made even more uncomfortable when they go home and what they are experiencing at home they can't undo that right so there are those biases that are and the lack of self-awareness and the assumptions and stereotypes that they hear and are echo and echo in their brains because they've heard them as they grew. That's and to and to the, the part of that is colored by shame of their families, which is really uncomfortable. Um, negativity around 
um, oh, I, I can't help it. This is how I was raised. I had a parent call me and tell me in our um, in our First Nations meeting in New It Voices course, the, the literature course. Uh, well, my my kid was raised raised to believe that you know certain things, and you're 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 undermining our household values. <laughs> 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 And it's creating uncomfortable conversations at home. It's creating uncomfortable conversations at the dinner table and good, right? Like, but but also that means that there's some friction and kids don't, they, it, there's divided loyalty then between what they want the world to be for when their own uh, uh, children inherit the, that world. They have a vision of better, but that's divided with their loyalty to the past and that's really Hard. And so kids are very defensive of the values their parents have taught them. And, and it's, I think in a way it's irresponsible of teachers to awaken that uh, questioning in a student without giving them some of the tools they'll need to, to manage their peer groups and their parents and other apps that they run into, right? You, mm-hmm. you, you awaken this, curious, this questioning or this interrogation of themselves, but you don't equip them with how to do it with those different groups. And it can create so much harm, right? right? Like if one back to the previous question yeah. in terms of their self-awareness. And There's nobody in the world who loves a child more than their parents. This is, this is not possible. So it's important that as you try to help kids see the world from different perspectives, that you also give them those tools to make sure that they're able to maintain that relationship with the parent in as good a way as possible. It's tough because remember, their parents weren't raised that way, mm-hmm. and so you're also you're, you're creating changes in a household that you never go into mm-hmm. um, physically. Though you're there, you know when those kids are talking to those parents, and it's not that kids can't disagree with their parents. Having a 14 year old daughter, <laughs> they're pretty darn good at it, um, but you still have to uh, to help them to navigate those things in a safe way. And all these things linked to the oral yeah. communications expectations in both English and common course. <laughs> Seriously, as we're talking That's about true. it, like it's not it's not like we're asking to enfranchise them with anything above and beyond the curriculum. Right. Like as we're talking about these things, as you all hit on the things we yeah. get students to advocate for themselves, you could easily find expectations in the oral visual part of the curriculum to support it. I, I agree with you. The, the curriculum definitely does support it, and I love the idea that we're talking about this uh, humility because it's something the sense of entitlement. That um, is, is what I've struggled with when, when trying to have these difficult conversations, either in a classroom context or in a library context. But what I'm wondering is, are there any places that have good resources to support teachers who want to have these conversations, who maybe don't have um, an, an academic background in social justice or equity or things like that? I mean, I find as teachers, we make it a one-off workshop. And then we're expected to somehow go into a classroom and responsibly have these discussions and not leave students in a position, as you were saying, where they don't, uh, they, they go home and they don't know how to manage that conversation at home. Or you're in a classroom and something, someone says something and you don't know how to respond. And you may inadvertently continue that process of doing harm, even though you had good intentions. And I've seen it happen over and over again. So I'm wondering, are there any places where you have had support in coming to able to have those conversations with students? I'll speak on my own my own experience, and I'm not uh, advocating for any organization or anything like that. No. Um, uh, Elementary Teacher Federation of Ontario, EDFO, has uh, mm-hmm. some great resources that are great entry points and great context builders, but then the work is really left on, on you, because you know the context of the conversations you'll have and the families that you're, the sense of entitlement you're dealing with, you, you figure that out. But uh, content content builders and, and helping you enter into the conversation, uh, EDFO has some great resources. Um, the, if you are experiencing or working with a community where Islamophobia is a, um, a prevalent, well, it's, a bit, it's, it's happening everywhere right now, but um, uh, NCCM, which is a National Council for Canadian Muslims, they have some excellent not more than 15 page documents that uh, and that kind of uh, uh, empower you with stats, figures, um, to get you concerned, conversation and sentence starters for you to engage in the conversation that will allow for the bodies that you're speaking with to lay out the landscape of how they feel about 
the population in question, so you don't have to like force it on them. They, you'll ask them probing questions, and they will lay it out to you. Or they will articulate their feelings. That will allow you to, to work with it a little better. So I feel like the resources are are are, are very good. Um, unfortunately, with the uh, not unfortunately, just the honest truth about allyship and trying to do the good work is that it does still demand from you. Uh, you know, footsteps and being present in certain things. So if you ever hear about town halls that are being organized um, to talk about these problems, though they may geographically be an inconvenient location, hopefully it's live stream, but um, things like that, those those opportunities allow you to, not if, if not build your content, at least if the content is built in your mind of understanding the issues and the facts and, and where you need to move forward, at least you will be able to have an opportunity to meet with knowledgeable others that can help you move forward. So it's not it's not an isolating um, task, of, uh, it, the, the power come in numbers and working with others. So those three steps, I think, would be okay in your points. Yeah, I mean, how do you know what you know? You live it, so you have to try it. You know, here's, I was brutally honest when I said it this morning, this idea that information flows around in a circle. When you make a mistake, you spend time with the person who you made the mistake with and say, what did I do? what exactly played out. You learn from their experience telling you here's what happened. And then you say, because they're the person who are li they're living the experience, you say to that person, like, what can I have done differently? What can I do now? How can I fix it? And that's that humility. It's that understanding that you're living this life and you are learning constantly. We talk about lifelong learner, right? We come up with catchphrases for these things, but what are you actually doing? Life is something you do, and, and, and it's scary, right? I mean, let's face it, you know, for those of us who don't get paid in the summer, right? We're coming at the end of August, we're all, it's scary, you know? And you're hoping, you know, I can't wait for that first pay. But you live it, and because you've done it more than once, you have that reasonable expectation that it will be okay, and things will work out. When you see somebody living an experience you haven't lived, the best thing you can do is be humble and say, is there anything I can do to help? And if they say no, respect that. But if they say yes, even if it's just listening, there's an opportunity for you to grow as a person and for you to help them as well grow as a person and find safety. Mm -hmm. oh, put your hand up. Yeah, okay. yeah. 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 Sure. Um, so I, I just, this is like so good. Um, I'm just wondering about when you're engaging with a colleague and they see something. Yeah. And how do you, because I guess I try to I want to open up a dialogue, like I do, but sometimes you get really defensive, right? And yes. so, but I'd rather it be like, how, what can I say to you to open up a dialogue about something? Um, especially if you feel that they might have marginalized someone or said something that could be hurtful. Um, so I don't know, I just wondered about how you would navigate uh, that practice, situation. In my practice, of being, when people say something I know is untrue, because it gets said all the time about my people, I just have them start to explain it and really tend to expose the shallowness of what they actually think they know. Like the big one is taxes uh, with us, right? Indians don't pay taxes. I've paid taxes my whole life. Uh, but so it's an interesting when somebody will say that because it is a motif that's constantly repeated in the media. It's one of the first criticisms about us. Why don't we have clean drinking water? They don't pay taxes. Um, you know, and it's this interesting thing because then if you just say to the person, like, well, really, they don't pay taxes? Can you explain that one to me? And, and they can't because nowhere in the tax act does it say Indians don't pay taxes. Um, you have to really delve into it. You have to understand the Indian Act in those particular situations when we actually don't pay taxes, which are very rare. Yeah. Um, and, and then the next thing usually I find you say to me is just examine the argument and say, so is that is that what, what happens if you don't pay taxes, you don't get clean drinking water in this country? Which is a really interesting thing for people to really start to try and investigate because then you really come down to what does it need to be Canadian? I was going to just say, tell me more. Yeah. Yeah. Open up the conversation. Force them to explain their point of view. Because while their point of view might be inaccurate, it is being fueled by something that they have experienced or been taught, and you have the opportunity to help them understand it in a better way. But it starts with making them explain where that came from. Yeah. That's exactly what you just said, but it's open-ended questions. Open-ended questions until they realize that they are wrong. 
or that they got wrong information, or that something is inaccurate, and you can provide context to the situation. And you may not see it uh, immediately. Mm -hmm. You open up that yeah. question, and they, they think about it. They may go away, and maybe a couple of days when they come to that realization. So if they walk away, and you think you haven't had an impact on them, just by asking the question, uh, you may have had that impact. I'm just going to also say, um, and I and I struggle with this. Um, because at some point they need to be told that they're coming, that they're incorrect. They need to be told, like not every, like you know, that there there are tr there are truths that are built on foundations that don't exist, and so they need to be told at some point that. But offering them another point of view, would you like to learn something else about this topic? Which I have other resources. <laughs> Going back to that resource question, and I'm, I I stepped out to the washroom, but there are too many resources out there. So one of the things we can do is curate for people resources that are, um, that are, you know, that present information that's accessible and that have, that are balanced and that have, uh, that can open uh, uh, questions and, but yeah, but offering that, would you like to learn another way of looking at this? Would you like to learn why you're incorrect, right? And I'm okay with saying that. I'm not, I don't, I'm not a very tactful person. I was asked that in an interview once. What's a weakness? I, I lack tact, right? So would you like to know why you're wrong? No one likes to think so. That's a, a, a problem I have. So I have to learn to be less defensive, right? And so, um, in my colleagues here are very correct in that have opening up a non defensive dialogue is a better approach because you put people's up back against the wall, they're not going to be open to learning. But I attempt to say, you know, you want, to, you know, okay, that's interesting. Would you like to know why you're, why you're, why that statement is incorrect? Would you like to know resources so you could actually learn more about this topic. And there's a really good book, uh, The um, Indigenous Rights. Yes. Such a good book about, so yeah, it has so many great, accessible conversations in it. Um, they have the downstairs library. So yeah, it's, um, yeah, that's a great one about um, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit issues. And, and then we'll move into that one more comment, and then we're actually at the end. Oh, that's weird. So, so we're going to say over time to do the last two questions. We have to go because Jennifer will get mad if we miss no it. So if yeah, on the side, uh, the amazing thing we're having in the first panel is that you get you get four entry points really from from what everyone said, and I'll just end off with this. Um, I when you are quote unquote woke or what you know what you you know what you know, um, and you see the microaggressive statements or you see the insidious way that, and you know very well how they have the powers of media or politics fueling or supporting the way they feel. There is nothing wrong with leveraging the short time you have to address it by calling it out as it is. Um, this is I'm just saying an entry point, I'm not saying I'm right. But to let someone know that is that is sexist. Label it, first and foremost, label it, call it out. That is sexist because single or compound sentence, get right to the point. Yes. Um, if you want to tone police yourself and do it in a gentle way, that's fine. If you want to be aggressive, that's fine too, because you know what, the, the presence of anger and exhaustion is warranted at this point in time. If we're still fighting fights that occurred in the 50s, 60s, 1920s, if they still exist, they're prevalent now, and they're just morphing throughout the times, anger is, is acceptable. Or at least a tone of, of exhaustion is acceptable. Anyways, call it out, say why it is, and then further on, if you would like to be the support of other, would you have the choice of as well? because they have the choice to share what they share, and they're in a position of power where they're affecting students. So you have to, as a colleague, have a sense of urgency that this individual, if not checked, will go back and perpetuate the thing that they're doing again for kids over and over again, mm -hmm. that they, and that will live with them. So there is a sense of urgency there. So you can call it out, stay, say why, and then follow up with, if you'd like to learn more as to why that is, please, here, here's an opportunity. And also provide them an opportunity to apologize or give them an opportunity to have an entry point and be like, well, okay, never in my life did I ever think I was gonna be called racist or sexist, tell me why. You can do it personally, you can do it privately, you can pull them out in the hall. I, I wouldn't recommend doing it publicly because it's just perceptions galore, yeah. but um, there's nothing wrong with s labeling it, stating it what it is, and as to why. And it's a courageous step to take, 100%. but you can bet that your call other colleagues who are witnessing the same behavior uh, will be over the moon that somebody stood up and, and said something about it because it's one of those things where what you don't address, you're condoning. They, they, 
continues mm -hmm. to be behavior, right? So it is a, a very courageous step to take, but it's something we have to do. And as an administrator, I think it's even more urgent and paramount that um, uh, because it's abusive when it's okay. when it's at when at that point there's a there's an abuse issue there too. But if this person is perpetuating um, harmful will use the, the there's children's well-being at stake. Yeah. But feel free to take the approach that's going to work for you. Mm -hmm. you know, because <laughs> four hundred points. Yeah. And which is which really is amazing. It's, it's one of those things you have to understand. You have a place where you are. And you have a purpose for being there. And you are there because you are the right person to be there. That's the way the world works. You, you hear the ideas and you go away and you find what is your way to. Because here's four entry points. When you figure it out, you're number five. So the next two questions that we're uh, you're going to talk about over the next uh, rest of the day were uh, what can we actually do? So the, the next one was uh, what do we have to offer these marginalized groups? And then the fourth one was how do we teach and demonstrate humility? So we covered that one pretty well. Uh, I think the important thing is to have that initial conversation that is uh, how can you know how can we um, how can we connect rather than that idea that Andrew Tyne and I talked about this morning is often when we reach out to some of these groups we're reaching out from a point of view. You need my help. Mm -hmm. So I'm here to save you or to help you rather than it be a reciprocal thing. But I think that the starting point is to ask and say, you know, what can we both get out of this connection? And then make, make it uh, meaningful for both uh, both groups. Um, you, you guys have all been fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for coming today. And feel free to connect with them. I know they didn't offer, but connect with them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if you have follow-up questions, we'll, uh, there are information all on the website. Thank you. Thank you. I was trying to tag you on your pictures. Yeah, me too. I was yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, at. Yeah.